are, Proverbs chapter 15. Let's begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 6, and we'll get into our study. Proverbs chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. Solomon writes, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. In the house of the righteous, there's much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked, is trouble. And so Solomon begins here by giving simple insights into how wisdom actually works. And notice he begins by giving instructions concerning confrontations. He begins by saying, a soft answer turns away wrath. Now, when it says a soft answer turns away wrath, this would be speaking of someone who has extreme anger at you, wrath, extreme anger. And so he's saying, instead of pouring gasoline on the fire, attempt to calm down the situation. You see, some people escalate the anger by escalating and elevating the situation. So if you're having a discussion with somebody who's very angry, well, instead of raising your voice, calmly lower it. I can tell you from personal experience, that's very effective. Because on various occasions as a minister, I've had to deal with these kinds of confrontations. I've had to deal with angry people. And if you begin to raise your voice because they're raising theirs, it only escalates. It only gets worse. But I've discovered that if you lower your voice and have a calmness, that it has a tendency of, of diffusing the problem. Anybody who's married knows that the minute you begin to raise your voice in an argument, it's all over. And so it's very wise to be very careful in the way that you speak. Now, the words that Solomon uses helps us to understand the situation he's describing. He says, uh, and I'll read it to you again, a soft answer. The word soft is, is a word that can be translated gentle or tender. A gentle or tender answer turns away wrath. The word wrath speaks of rage, a burning anger or fury. Then he speaks of harsh words. The word harsh speaks of painful or offensive. And he says that those words stir up, they provoke, or they cause to grow. So again, the way we respond to people often determines their way that they respond to us. We should always speak with a gentleness, at least do the best that we can, and a reasonableness. And we ought to speak, especially in situations that are, that are tense, we ought to speak in what has been called a conciliatory fashion. Speak with humility and do so because it can save a situation from escalating into something that is far worse. You'll see he says a similar thing in verse 18, by the way, in the same chapter. He says, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. And so basically, if someone's getting in your face and everything, be very careful that you don't answer in kind. Be very careful that you do your best in the Lord to speak with a gentleness, to speak with a, a kindness to the best of your ability. And, it, and if that doesn't work, just hit them. Um, <laughs> verse 2, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. So a wise person isn't rash. A wise person will answer thoughtfully, and he considers whom he is speaking to. And so this would encourage us not to rush into giving our opinions, and uh, 
not to rush into giving your advice to someone. It's always wise to wait and to think before you speak. He said, the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Uh, the word pour means gushes out. The mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The foolishness gushes out like, like a water pipe that has been broken or like a geyser that just is exploding. He's saying that's how they speak. It just pours out of them. Remember, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And in Proverbs 10, verse 19, it says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So God sees everything. You can't hide anything from him. That's something that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when the story is told of, and it's not a story, when the event is reported of Eve and Adam and the forbidden fruit, and in their taking of that fruit, as you know, the book of Genesis describes, and how that they fashioned for themselves fig leaves and began to basically hide themselves from the presence of God. They actually seemed to think that they could hide from God, but the eyes of the Lord um, go throughout the whole earth. God sees everything. Nothing's hidden from his view. He sees not only how we are on the outside, but he also sees us on the inside. He knows us thoroughly, and so he's making it very clear that, that God sees everything, and, and God knows everything, and, and it, it makes an interesting point here when it says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Notice, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So God sees everything, both the good for reward and the evil for judgment. And armed with this knowledge, seeing that we know that he does, we should live properly. In Proverbs 5, 21, it says, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. Hebrews 4, 13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so be aware of the fact that the Lord sees everything. He knows everything. We can't get away with anything, not even a thought. He knows the words on our tongue before they're even formed. He knows everything about us. And so instead of trying to hide from him, we ought to be aware of the fact that he already knows. We're not fooling him. And because we're aware that he knows all things, that ought to encourage us to live in such a way that reward will be ours. Verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. The word wholesome speaks of health. And so the point he's making here is be careful what you say because your words can hurt or your words can heal. You know, when I grew up, and still growing up, let's say, when I was in the process of being a youth, um, and all of us have heard this before, we, we, we would say when somebody was speaking to us or saying something to us we didn't like, we might say something like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Anybody ever hear that? Or is that just ancient history? I think Washington said that. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's not true. Your spirit heals slower than your physical bones. Words that are spoken to you as a child can plague you as an adult. You know that, don't you? Things that were said to you and of you can plague you for the rest of your life if you don't allow the Lord to heal you. If you don't begin to understand that though the words that were spoken to you by others were intended for hurt, God can actually heal you and transform you, make you brand new, and he can make you in such a way that, that you actually begin to see your value, not in how men and women speak of you, but how he speaks of you and, and what he actually thinks of you. His, his thoughts concerning us are, are too numerous to be counted. And he loves us. And, and he has called us his children. And he has said, I have forgiven you. He has said, I have given you a new life. 
He has said, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He said, your sins have been cast into the deepest part of the sea. He has said to me that, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he separated my sins. And he will remember them no more. And so if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. He knows all things. And so be aware of that. And be careful about what you receive from others when they're saying things that, that may be untrue and demeaning. But also be wise when a word of correction is being given, especially when you know that's the spirit of the Lord speaking to your heart, that things need to be changed. So be careful what you say. And be careful how you speak to others. Your words can hurt. In Proverbs 12, verse 18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. So be aware of those things. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Verse 5, a fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. A fool despises his father's instruction. A, 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 a fool doesn't value doesn't obey his father's teachings. So a fool despises his father's instructions, but notice how it says he who receives reproof is prudent. Did you use that word today, prudent? No. It's not a word we normally use, but the word prudent speaks of having discernment. It, it speaks of being discerningly aware. And so when a son listens to his father's counsel and begins to put it into practice, that son begins to develop discernment. Uh, the, the counsel of a godly father gives him the ability to know right from wrong. The counsel of a father can help a young person uh, be able to discern truth from error. The counsel can help him to learn to follow instructions. Also, you see, when, when, a, when, when somebody is raised in a home with a mom and a dad, and dad has an active part in raising the child, and because the father represents authority in the home, the way the son or the daughter, but the way the child responds to the instructions of the father actually are preparing them for life. And so when a father is respected and his word is filled with integrity and his life is filled with faith, he loves the Lord. It would be a foolish son to disregard the things that that dad is teaching. And, and all you need to do is, if you're a godly father, is to point to your life and ask your son or your daughter if God has not blessed you. I've done that in my life with my children. I've said, if you follow the Lord as I have, see how God has blessed me. And all I really want for you is blessings. I, I want your life to be filled with God's joy and his blessings. And so follow my instructions. From the time my children were born, I, I can still remember, I've said this before, it comes to mind, even as I'm sharing, how that, that my daughter Corinne was a toddler. She was just learning to walk at all. And, and I pulled into the driveway at, at home. I had come home from work. And as I was pulling into the driveway, she was outside with her mama. And as I pulled up the driveway, she saw me, and, and, and Corinne would get very excited. She came running to me to try and get my wallet. And, and as, <laughs> as I came pulling up the driveway, uh, I remember her getting real excited, and, and she came running, uh, and she tripped, and she, she tripped on, on something and fell face first onto the sidewalk. And, and you know, I, I, I still remember slamming the brakes in the car, jumping out and running over there and picking up my one-and-a-half-year-old crying baby and holding her. And I cried. See, I, I know that surprises you, but I have, I have a deep, a deep sense of love for my children. And, and in my heart, I, I, from the beginning, I wanted to save them from pain. I didn't want them to go through it. For some reason, I just didn't want them to go through pain. And when I saw them, you know, hurt, I, I cried to this day. And my children are not babies, but to this day, if they cry, 
I cry with them. I cry thinking about crying with them. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. How much more so your father? How much more so our God desires us not to be in, in a situation that is painful for us. And he gave to us, if you have one, praise God for a godly father. If you had a godly father, that's a great gift to you. And the son is a wise man if he regards the counsel of his father. When my dad died, I went to his home. My mom had moved. I, I, we had just finished moving her. I remember the truck filled with her few items that, that she owned, uh, pulling out of a driveway at the house that she and my father had lived together in as she moved off to, to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I remember just standing there watching the truck as it pulled out of the driveway for the last time, and it's gone. And our church began in that house. So I had sentimental attachment to it. And so I would go there for Thanksgiving to see my parents and Christmas and all. And, and I, I still remember walking into the den. Everybody was gone. And it's just me. And I sat down and I wept like a baby. And I started speaking to myself and I started saying, who am I going to ask advice from now? Who am I going to go to? Because I could do that with my dad. I could ask dad, what would you do, Pop? What would you do? And I still remember that. So, you know, a, a godly father, a, a, a man with wisdom is to be greatly valued, greatly cherished. And a son is wise if he listens to the father when that father gives counsel. It helps the, the son to develop discernment in life. It, it helps him to know that there is a right and that there is a wrong. It, it helps him to know what is true and what is false. And ultimately, it helps him when he gets a job and begins to work. It helps him to understand uh, a chain of authority and, and why it's wise to listen to those who have proper authority over you. You see, how a person responds to correction reveals their character, and it reveals their maturity. And so Proverbs 19, 20 says, listen to counsel, receive instruction, that you may be wise in your latter days. Verse six, in the house of the righteous, there's much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked <laughs> is trouble. Uh, notice how he says, in the house of the righteous, there's much treasure. Prosperity in the Old Testament especially is very clearly presented as one reward for righteousness. And, and that's because prosperity can originate with God. In Proverbs 10, we saw this at verse 22. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. He adds no sorrow with it. Yet when the wicked gathers wealth, very often they gain it in ungodly ways. So calamity can be the outcome of gaining finances wrongly. And we know there are wrong ways to gain finances. You think just a couple basic obvious ones, like organized crime or selling drugs or things of that nature. You can gain finances that way, but the outcome will be chaos, if you will, calamity. Proverbs 13, 11 says, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. Wise people's words are profitable to listen to, and it is wise to listen to someone who's wise, to gain from their experience, to learn from them is a wise thing to do, and it says the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. If you have somebody in your life that that has genuine godly wisdom. I'm not talking about worldly wisdom. There are quite a number of people who have plenty of that. No, I'm talking about godly wisdom. I'm talking about somebody who knows the word really well, somebody who's been in the word of God and been well taught for years. And, and you know this person. It's always wise to be able to receive from them. 
They are. Their words are profitable to listen to. I have, I have several friends of mine that I, I consider to be just very wise, and, and I'm always willing to hear from them the things that they have to say. Men like Don McClure, men like Joe Foch, men like Mike McIntosh, tremendous experience in the things of the Lord. Men like Raul Reese, I love to tease about Raul, but he's a very dear friend of mine and a very wise, very wise man. When this church first began, I'll give you one example. When this first church, church first began, uh, we, needed, we needed a place for the church because we were growing. And so my assistant at that time and I began to think, how can we, how can we um, you know, outfit a place for the church because the church needs a place to meet. And so I called Rawl and asked if I could come and see him for a little while. And, and so he said, yeah. And so my assistant and I went and I began to speak to him. And I said, Rawl, listen, our church is growing. We don't have a place to meet. I'm thinking of taking a second out on my house. My assistant is thinking of taking a second out on his. And that way we can take the money out of our home and we can find a, a building somewhere, outfit it, and the church can meet there. And, and we sincerely wanted to do something so the church would have a place. And I'll never forget Rawl when he said, don't do that. And I said, why? He said, because if you put all of your income into the church, he said, you will own it. You need to have the church made aware that it's where they meet. They ought to support that work. That was wisdom from Rawl. I wonder who told him. No, that was wisdom. <laughs> oh, it was me. No. So it's always profitable to listen to the wisdom of those who go before you. But the fool won't do so. And we ought not to listen to those who are foolish. So we should be those who dispense wisdom because we have knowledge. Um, we should never be ashamed to share the most profitable knowledge that we have, the knowledge of the Lord. And in Proverbs, again, in chapter 10, verse 21, it says, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of wisdom. Verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness Sacrifices that are given by those not serving God are not acceptable to him. And you say, really? And the answer is, yes, really? Um, remember all the way back in the Old Testament book of Genesis. Remember how that the scripture speaks about Adam and, well, actually speaks of two of the sons, the sons of Adam, Cain and Abel. And you remember that both of them came and brought offerings to the Lord. When you look at the story of Cain and Abel, Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, but Cain brought an offering of his produce. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says it like this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. What it is, is both of those sacrifices under Mosaic law were acceptable offerings because God has grain offerings as well as blood offerings and sacrifices. You see that in scripture. What was the difference? The difference is represented by faith. When Abel offered, he did so in faith. But when Cain offered, he did so in flesh. God regarded the offering of the one given in faith, rejecting the one that was given by flesh. So there are those who try and buy God by doing good things or making offerings or sacrifices, thinking that somehow God will honor that. And scripture says, that's not what is going to happen. As a matter of fact, again, it's the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. And the way of the wicked is an abomination 
No, God doesn't receive those sacrifices. Verse 10, harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way, and he who hates correction will die. That's what I tell my kids. <laughs> the person who forsakes God has a life of harsh correction. And if he refuses to repent, his life will be miserable and will ultimately, in the end, be judged. That's why Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. And so do not be upset when God chastens you because he loves you. Verse 10, harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way. And he who hates correction will die. Didn't I just read that? Yeah, I did. Verse 11, I said, boy, that sounds familiar. Verse 11, <laughs> I'm getting used to this. I told you, let me move this. There we go. <laughs> I, told, I know it's gonna take a while. Verse 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. So how much more the hearts of the sons of men? Okay, we've already noted that God knows everything. And it's already been stated here in this chapter, he judges righteously. Psalm 90 verse 8 says it like this. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Interesting, I, I like that scripture, your when it speaks concerning our secret sins. Anybody here? Well, no, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> there are some men's sins, Paul says, that go before them. And there are others whose sins follow after. Interesting phrase. Some people's sins are obvious. Just look at them. If somebody's staggering drunk, his sin's obvious. Even if he's trying to, we used to use the term maintain. Even if he's trying to maintain, you can still see that he's inebriated. You can still see that he's drunk. There are some sins that are real obvious, and they go before. And then there are secret sins. There are the kind of sins that we hide well, we mask well. Those are the sins that I, that I get the most concerned about because they're masked. You know, when I, I've spoken to people who are inebriated, that's one thing because we can speak on an honest level. It's difficult to speak to the one who won't admit that they are hiding things. That's hard. That's difficult because they won't admit. They won't confess. They, they hide it. There are people who have secret sins, things that they do in the privacy of their home, things they do when they think nobody's looking. But God knows everything. And if God knows something like hell and destruction, if God comprehends those kinds of things, it's pretty simple for him to know a person's heart. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, Jeremiah writes, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. You know, I've had people say, you can't judge me, you don't know my heart. And they're right, I don't, but God does. And it's desperately evil. That's what he says, and it's true. And so, God comprehends all things. So before the Lord are all of our ways, he knows everything. Verse 12, a scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. A scoffer is a person who is proud and arrogant. He doesn't listen when corrected, and, and he will not 
seek advice from anyone. Now, that's a dangerous place to be. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. It's always a good thing, once again, and you're seeing this as a theme, by the way, in chapter 15. It's, it's a good thing to listen to godly correction. It's a good thing to seek godly advice. It's a good thing for these things because it helps you to become a person that is blessed by the Lord. But if we continually resist and reject, if, if we will not take correction and we think we're already there, we've already arrived, there's really very little hope for us to ever mature. And if we don't ask for advice, we isolate ourselves, well, basically what we do is we reject wise judgment and end up reaping what we've been sowing. Verse 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. That's an interesting thing. Um, Basically, it's simply saying that if somebody, if somebody has joy in their heart, it usually makes its way, that joy makes its way to the face. So somebody who's got joy is going to be somebody that, you'll, you'll know it, it radiates. Um, I've, I've known people who, who, it looks like they just, you know, drank lemon juice, you know. They, if, they're, if they're joyful, you know, they hide it very well. So he's, he's just basically saying that. He's saying, listen, um, when you've got a great, a, a, a merry heart, when you're filled with joy, then, then it, it has a way of affecting every bit of you. It has a way of finding its way to your face, if you will. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Um, I, I, I want to have, have a joyful heart. I, I want to be filled with the hope that God gives with the knowledge that that, um, that, that no matter what the circumstances we find ourselves in or I find myself in, that God is always God. And, and you know, when it, some of the lessons you learn are lessons you learn over time. Um, there, there are things that, that, that when you're going through them, you think they'll never end. You're raising your kids and your kids don't seem to be doing well. Or you're going through difficult times. I'll be sharing on Sunday, uh, a little bit about a man named D.L. Moody, and, and basically I'll get ahead of myself from my, my notes on Sunday, but D.L. Moody's father died when he was a little boy. He basically was shipped off into having to work as a little boy. Uh, his mother had nine children. She was pregnant with twins when his father died, and he had to go on. He had to work, and as a little boy, he didn't want to do this, and his, he ran away and tried to get his mother to take him home, but she couldn't do it. She couldn't afford it. She didn't have any way. And ultimately, what he did is he grew up. He became very hardened and very difficult, ended up going to uh, Boston. His uncle owned a shoe store, and while in the shoe store, he, it was a requirement that, the, that his uncle had given, and that is that he had to go to church. He started going to church there in Boston at the age of 17. The Sunday school teacher, Kimball, was paying visits to the Sunday school uh, members of his class and went and saw him at the, went and saw him at the, the shoe store and led him to faith in Christ. And I'll be quoting Kimball, something he said, I'll paraphrase, but he said, when I had uh, D.L. Moody in my Sunday school class, he had the darkest soul of anybody I'd ever seen. If there was anybody that I could not believe would ever serve God and know the gospel, it was D.L. Moody. And yet in history, D.L. Moody is, has been ranked as one of the greatest evangelists the United States ever had. And it's recorded that over a million people came to faith in Christ through D.L. Moody. God has a way of reaching into people's lives, transforming them, and giving them um, what they've never had before, and that's the joy of salvation. And, and that's something that causes us to have a merry, a merry heart. Verse 14, the heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, 
but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. Learning is an ongoing quest, especially learning about God. And as you, as a believer, are growing, you're going to discover the more that you learn of him, the more you desire to know of him. So learning of God is never satisfied here on earth. In Proverbs 1, verse 5, we read, A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 6 said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Verse 15 all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. A uh, life can be a joy or a sorrow, depending on your perspective. Psalm 34, 19 says, and I want you to notice how verse 15 said, the days of the afflicted are evil. Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Isn't that interesting? We could speak about that for a moment. Um, you get saved and you think you'll never have a bad day again, and, right? I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm wonderfully saved. Praise God, he washed me, I'm cleansed, I got a new life. Uh, he's doing a wonderful work in me. Oh, Lord, you're so good. And then the next day you wake up and you're miserable. I mean, it, 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 it comes quickly. And, and there's so much we can say about this. Again, Sunday I'll be sharing uh, about this concerning the perilous times that will come in the last days and all, but one of the things that you will discover, and this is something that requires um, some maturity to, to grasp, um, is that, that your faith is often fashioned in the furnace of affliction. If, if you're not going through anything, how are you going to be stretched? And so what happens is the Lord refines your faith through various trials. And, and you're purified. Uh, it's, it's called re the refiner's fire. Even as gold and silver are heated, so the impurities come out. Even so, we go through various afflictions, tribulations, trials, persecutions, but they're not to destroy us. If you've ever said, God, make me like you. Have you? Because if you have, <laughs> Jesus was the wounded healer. He, he was aware of pain, and he was aware. As a matter of fact, I'll say it like this. The scripture says he was a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and rejected of men. The, Isaiah speaks of the fact that they, they ask him, and where are those wounds? Where did you get those wounds? He said, these are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. He had a, a disciple, a man by the name of Judas, who, who was so tight in the group that when, when it was stated that one of you will betray me, no one thought it was Judas. And yet that night, as we all know, he was betrayed. He knew loneliness in a level that no person could ever know. He left more than anything we'll ever leave. He left, there's this old song, he left the splendors of heaven knowing that his destiny was a lonely hill called Golgotha where he laid down his life for me. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all because through those afflictions, through those tough times, through those times of pain, your character is shaped, your faith is refined, you're matured, and you become that woman or that man of God that you want it to be. So if you've asked the Lord, God, work in me, don't be surprised when it seems that, quote, unquote, all hell breaks loose. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when your friends don't want anything to do with you anymore. When people mock you, don't be surprised. Jesus prayed. He said, now I'm alone. And yet I'm not alone, for you are with me. You're never alone. He's always with you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You're never alone. 
God is fashioning you and God is working on you. God is the potter and you are the clay. And there are times that you as the clay may feel that the hands of the potter are no longer present in your life, no longer on you. But you need to remember that there are times when the potter removes his hand from the clay in order to dampen with water so he may continue the work and the process. Because when the Lord seems to remove his hands from you, he never has. His attention remains on you, and he's just going to anoint you for more of the water of the Spirit. I hope somebody's hearing me right now because I think you need to hear this. God is working in you. God is going to do it. Amen. 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 And so, verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Very simply put, for a believer, spiritual blessings are always more satisfying than the material. Verse 17. Better is dinner with herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. So somebody's reading this and says, I better get a lot of friends named Herb. No, these are herbs. <laughs> we'll have dinner, Herbs and me. No, no, it's not a nickname and that's not a man's name. But that's true. When you look at this, um, at dinner with herbs, uh, why does he use that? Uh, well, herbs and fatted calf are placed in what is called juxtaposition. They're placed in a, uh, for comparison because the uh, dinner of herbs re represents the food that the poor would eat. They couldn't afford meat, so they were vegetable, eating vegetables, vegetarians, if you will, not vegans, but they would, that, that's all they had to eat. A fatted calf is uh, literally is what is called a stall-fed calf. And that's cruel, we know, but it's a, a calf that was kept in a stall and fed and fed, so it became a delicacy. Uh, something similar today would be Kobe beef. It's, it's just a very expensive cut of meat. And so there's, that's, the, that's the comparison. So the dinner of vegetables is a meal for the poor. The fatted calf uh, is the meal for a rich person. And the bottom line is it, it's, it's better just to eat you know, poorly and uh, then to have to put up with a bunch of mean people at a dinner table. He's kind of speaking of Thanksgiving for us. <laughs> Verse 18, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he was slow to anger, allays contention. Um, there are angry people who stir up anger and discord. They start fights. So it's more blessed to be a peacemaker than a troublemaker. Verse 19, the way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. That's an interesting uh, way to put it. Lazy people, he's saying, the lazy person makes excuses for not producing by saying there are just too many obstacles. But the person of faith sees obstacles as opportunities. That's a good word. It's something we need to remember. Um, in pastoral ministry, one of the things my staff can tell you, I, I will ask on occasion, is if I say, I think we ought to do this, and, and the response is, mm, it's going to be tough. Um, my, my standard response is, why? Why not? Why can't we do that? What's keeping us from doing that? Why? Why? What's impossible about this? Is this impossible? I don't think it is. Because you, you've got, with God, all things are possible. If the Holy Spirit is moving, flow with him. Now, if it's your flesh, that's something else. But if the Holy Spirit is saying, no, I'm placing something on your heart. Oh, just, it's, Pastor Chuck said, I want to be under the spout where the glory comes out. There's just this, there's this sense that of exhilaration when you see God move and people say, I, wow, how'd that happen? He saw the Lord. He gets all the glory. All we did is just go with the flow of what the Spirit, 
So, but the lazy person on the other hand, oh, there's just too many obstacles. It's too, it'd be too hard to do. I can't. And, and in this particular case, he says, that's a lazy person. He makes excuses, uh, and I, I just won't do it. I can't. It's too difficult. So no, we need to see obstacles as opportunities. In verse 20, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. That speaks for itself. When a father sees his son doing well, it causes, causes him great joy. And we know that children can be blessings, but we also know that when they're not doing well, they are incredible sources of sorrow. Verse 21, folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment. Man of understanding walks uprightly. The fool not only lives sinfully, but he actually finds joy in living sinfully. On the other hand, a wise man marks his steps properly because he follows the Lord. Verse 22, without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Um, there's just a basic thing here. Do not seek counsel that only always agrees with your plans because you can end up failing. There's nothing wrong with hearing various sides, especially when you're seeking wisdom. You want to hear somebody else's comments in the event that maybe you just didn't see that. But if you always have people who are agreeing with you, then you're not necessarily going to make the best decisions. Verse 23, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? In other words, when you give good advice, you can have a sense of joy. Have you discovered that? And somebody comes and says, you know, I'm thinking, and you say, and the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Holy Spirit will, will prompt you to say something, and you'll, you'll be thinking as you're sharing, you're thinking, oh, this is good. Ooh, I had to write this down, write a book. This is amazing. But there, there are times when the advice that's flowing from you, the Lord just connects and you walk away with the joy. You say, I spoke for the Lord today. I know, I know, I know that God is doing something. It's exciting when that happens. Verse 24, the way of life winds upward for the wise that he may turn away from hell below. When, you're, when your ways please the Lord, it's an upward, rising, blessed life. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So there's an increasing. The way of life winds upward. Verse 25 the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. God is concerned with the poor, with the widow, but the proud often takes advantage of them. Psalm 146, verse 9, the Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. Verse 26, the thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, the words of the pure are pleasant. When it says the thoughts, it's not, it's not simply their thinking process. Thoughts speak of their intentions or their plans. He is saying God opposes the plans of the evil. And they will plan and very often may succeed, but it's always temporary because those plans are not blessed by God. And finally, moving on in verse 27 to the conclusion, he who is greedy for gain troubles his own house. He who hates bribes will live. Uh, when it says he who is greedy for gain troubles his own house but hates bribes, uh, that would be speaking of a judge receiving bribes in order to give unfair judgment. Uh, Proverbs 17.23 says a wicked man accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the courts of justice. So the result is that they, ru they ruin their own home and they destroy their own families. He destroys that. In verse 28, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. Here's something for you. It's very practical. Don't answer quickly. Don't be quick with an answer. 
Be the kind of person who listens to what's being said and considers what's being said before you speak. Take time to respond. Because when it says the heart of the righteous studies how to answer, he, he also says the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. There are times when somebody will say something to you that perhaps is, is hurtful. And, and the first thing you want to do is you want to respond in kind. You want to, you, they, 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 they say something to you and you want to respond in the same tone and say the same kind of thing that they said. And, and, and the result of that is only provoking more anger. It, it, it's, I don't, I've tried to learn to do this, and, and it, it's really, this is a scripture that gives support to that. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. One of the things I've tried to learn to do, guys, and you know it's taken a long time <laughs> to do this, but I think I have to some degree gotten to the point where I can say I try hard and succeed often. I try to listen to what people say even when I disagree 100% with them. Even when, because they're saying what they're saying for a reason. And what I'm really more concerned with is what's that reason? Why are you saying that? Because sometimes people will walk up and they'll say things that, that are, well, they just, don't, they just don't realize what they're saying can be hurtful. And if you respond quickly, you may be misunderstanding their whole point. I still remember, I've had people approach me when I've been gone and I've brought some great teachers in that, that have walked up and said, when are you going to be gone again? You bring in good teachers. Now, I, I appreciate that you love the teachers, but there are probably better ways to say you appreciated them without diminishing me. So it's always wise to wait, to hear, to consider before you respond. It's wiser to do that. It saves a lot of grief later on and a lot of misunderstanding. And if they have something that they're saying to you that you, you really disagree with and really get angry over, it's, it's wiser to just consider what they're saying and think about it for a while because there may be truth in it. You just don't like how it's being said right now. And it makes you mad because you're being insulted and you're being hurt and, and, and right away you wanna, you wanna defend yourself and you wanna let them know, you don't know me, who are you? When in fact, it may be the Holy Spirit speaking to you through a voice you're not familiar with. And so you can hear something being said through a different source because you've learned to shut everybody out. And this person speaking to you, so consider what they're saying. And listen, if they're right, change. But if they're not, leave it alone. Now, Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. So we need to learn to be wise. Verse uh, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked. He hears the prayer of the righteous. The wicked person is not close to the Lord, so his prayers will also be distant. And so how are you going to pray according to the will of the Lord if you're not walking with him? Verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. Uh, when it says the light of the eyes, that's a synonym for a cheerful look. Good, good news uplifts the spirit. And by the way, that's what the gospel does. Is it up, uplifts the, the spirit. Verse 31 and 32, the ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul. He who heeds rebuke gets understanding. We just looked at that. So listen to experience and you can grow. Reject counsel you'll remain immature. And finally, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. 
humble, faithful submission receives honor from Jesus himself. Humble, faithful submission puts you in the place to hear him say, well done, my good and my faithful, what? Servant. Servant. Keep that in mind. He doesn't say, my humble and faithful leader. He says, my servant. That's important to understand that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. The lords of this world are on the top and they lord it over everybody. Not so with you. He who is great in the kingdom will be servant of all. Even he said, you call me Lord and you call me master. You say, well, for so I am. If I then being your Lord and master have washed your feet, how much more so should you wash the feet of one another? So what is the greatness in the kingdom? The servant of all. The servant of all. Humility is the key to service. Keep that in mind.